There's no take two. There's no just a little more purple. Warts and all. You've downloaded the VO Radio Show. G'day, this is Andrew Peters. And g'day, I'm Darren Robertson, also known as Robbo. And this is the VO Radio Show, if you haven't worked that out already. So the lovely lady at the beginning of the show said yes. Yes, and the lovely lady is uh, Larissa Gallagher. Mm. She is represented by uh, Dean Panaro at Abrams Artist Management in Los Angeles. Mm. Give her some work. Yeah. She's very good. And she's mm. Australian. You wouldn't think so, she though, is. would you? No, didn't well, much like our guest today. Aha, uh-huh, exactly. And today's guest is uh, Nick Tate. And a lovely guy to boot. So uh, mm. we'll be talking to him about the more recent part of his voiceover career. And it mm. is intriguing, to say the mm. least. And here's just a, a bit of the interview. I mean, I was here for nearly three years. And although I'd had a fairly good voiceover career in Australia, I could not get arrested here. Yeah. Nobody would listen to my voice. And then I meet a guy at a party who recognises that he thinks I can do it. And he gives me the break. He introduces me to Tishman, one of the top voice agents in the world, who would never have touched me with a barge pole had Vince not said to him, you've got to listen to this guy. So I noticed, um, I noticed that you put that highlights package together, but there's nothing of you in there, mate. Which is most unusual. Yeah, well, it is. That's right, exactly. <laughs> nah, stick around because it's well worth listening to. Nick's a very insightful man, let alone his talent. Yeah. Um, as a voiceover. So, yeah. Yes. Very good. Yes, yeah, pretty good. The voice for the voices. This is the VO Radio Show. Now, I had the uh, pleasure of hearing some studio monitors um, last week, and it's uh, a Swiss handmade studio monitor called PSI. Mm. And mm. Uh, found a Sound on Sound article. The guy who was writing the article for Sound on Sound had his handful of the exceptional studio monitors, Vent Opals. Also, Earthworks, the Sigma 6.2. Yes. Now, I hadn't heard of these until you mentioned it before we started recording, and I've done my research. I, they're very nice. Yeah. They're quite bizarre, though, because they, they, they stack. Yes. They stack on top of each other, and the tweet is not enclosed, and they, they claim that it makes it more directional. Yeah. There's also the PMC's AML-1, mm-hmm. uh, the K&H 0300, yeah. and Acoustic Energy AE-22. Some nice monitors amongst that lot, that's yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's for sure. But yeah. the PSI, the A25M, there's also the A21M, um, mm. which also got a, a great rap. Mm. But they are quite amazing. So, I mean, they're, they're still not... I mean, I was looking at these earthworks. There's, it's, they're still a reasonable investment. It's it's about £2,500, which is, what, just over the $5,000 mark in Australian dollars and, and even less in the US dollars. Yeah, I'll um, say 4 and a half US, not, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's not an unreasonable investment for any size studio that's earning some reasonable money. But if I was mm-hmm. in your shoes, uh, where you've invested in your studio at home, so you can actually mm. do post and record stuff, yep. your money hourly rate hasn't really changed in the last 15 years. No, not really. Not a lot. It, um, it's been pretty stagnant, to be honest with you. And, there, and to be honest with you, there are clients that I uh, used to go out and freelance for that I now do from my home studio for a freelance rate. So even less than normal studio rates. Um, in some cases, the money hasn't changed from back in 1997 when I first started freelancing. Yeah. which is, um, Or it's gone up by $5 or, you know, something like that, which is crazy. These days I've invested money in a studio, but if I record from here, you rarely ever margin a studio rate. I think in the, in the advertising world, people are being squeezed left, right and centre, definitely. Um, everyone's looking for... Um, not necessarily the cheapest option, but the most cost-effective option. Um, and, the, and you certainly f- feel the squeeze in that area. But for me, the, for me, the big thing that the, the big thing that I notice is the places that I still go to, um, you know, where I've been going to for eight or nine years as a freelancer, and, I, and I'm still on the same rate that I was when I started. And that's not due to me not looking for an increase, but basically being told, well, you know, you can you can have a pay rise, but you know, basically expect less work. Yes. <laughs> so, so you know, so what do you do in that situation? You know, you sort of, have, you just have to go, well, okay, which one do I want? Whereas, you know, I guess with agency voiceover artists, at least there is a rate card here in Australia that protects them. Yeah. But then, you know, you're up against companies that have mothers who live at home who have a microphone stashed under the stairs and, and a little laptop and go in there and record their 30 second commercial for, you know, John's auto repair shop in, in Alice Springs for $10. Yeah, exactly. We actually had an email the other day from um, a, a gentleman called Bill Dowling, who owns Top Spots here in Sydney, actually sort of saying this. And, and his, his final words were, you know, you get what you pay for. 
while that's true, I think some of the bigger companies around town could probably be paying a bit more for what they get. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. It was interesting, actually. I saw that uh, email from, from Bill, mm. uh, and that was in reference to the uh, Mark Grau interview where Mark mm. was talking about the home studios, mm. which was an yeah, look, in- interesting discussion, I thought. Yeah. I Look, I... I uh, I, you know, I guess it's the industry that we're in. You know, everyone, everyone's looking to save a dollar and, and to, to maximise, you know, how far their dollars go. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, it, it, it's probably, we're probably not the only industry where the little fella is the one who, you know, who probably carries the most of the burden, to be fair. You've just got to be mindful if you're in the business that um, you've got to be able to make a living. Mm. Whatever you offer a client, basically. Mm. is how they're going to see you. So if you go out there and say, look, I'll do this job for you for 50 bucks, but remember me for mm. the next one. Yeah. But, you know, you pretty well guarantee that you're going to be the 50 buck guy. Yeah. My favourite one is, uh, is you know, when you get someone who comes to you and goes, look, I haven't got a budget for this, but, and you know what's coming, you know, and they sort of go, oh, but, you know, it, it'll get you some exposure and, you know, next time there'll be some money. I actually sort of have actually started saying no to that sort of stuff because the, the money never comes. You know, you chase your tail and I'm sure you've experienced it as well. Oh, absolutely. Um, I actually do another podcast um, and we were talking to a gentleman on that and and he was, he was saying that when he gets those requests now, he says, yes, I can give you an hour, but here's my favorite charity. And if you can make a donation or if you can bring me a a receipt to say that you've been to the, the blood bank or, you know, whatever it is that he, he wants that person to do, I'll spend an hour with you. I'll sit down with you in a coffee shop and spend an hour with you. And I thought, now that's not a bad way to go. Yeah. If you can afford it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I guess what he's saying is, look, I'm happy to work for you for free, but there's got to be something in it for someone. So, um, so, you know, I'll give you an hour if, and I thought, well, that's, that's an interesting approach. I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah. That's great. You know, all you've got to do is switch on late night TV to really hear, you know, what the world could be like if, if everyone shopped at the $10 audio shop down the road because it's, <laughs> yeah, it's just, a, just terrible. It's a shocker. It's yeah, shocking. I know. I yeah. know. And, and, and I think they're doing themselves a favour, but I mean, you know, to look at it from an advertising point of view, what are you doing for your brand? You know? Yeah. And I think people understand more and more. I mean, okay, they may not listen to it and go, well, you know, that's... You know, there's a there's a pop on the P or, you know, whatever, or, you know, the average Joe blogs at home. But I think they're starting to understand more and more and be able to look at stuff and go, well, you know, that's, you know, that's not quite right. It's interesting, isn't it? That's the difference between a small client and a big client. I yeah. Mean, I did a job this week for a big beer company and we did the animatics, would have been a month or so ago. And then I got the call to go in to do the the finals. But in the in the interim, the client ran everything through focus groups. But that's the difference between a client with a budget that's actually making sure that that product and that ad is spot on. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I do have concerns for our industry when, when you know, when a $10 rip and read and a, and a, and a $20 mix for TV are, are basically believed to suffice as, you know, good enough to go to air. I, I really think we should be protecting our industry a bit more than that. But um, yes. anyway, that's another, another conversation for another day. Yeah, it also scares me sometimes when I, I actually do check out those places where you can get a, a $20 voiceover. Mm. And there's a couple of voices on there you go, I think I know who that is. Yeah, right. It's yeah, like, yeah, what, yeah, yeah. what are you doing? What are you yeah. doing there? You know, anyway. Yeah, well, I suppose the attitude's starting to become if you can't beat them, join them. But at the same time, you're not, certainly not doing yourself any favours, eh? or any of us any favours. Yeah, but I, I think you can beat them, so I think it's... Uh, no, yeah, I think you can too. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, crazy anyway, stuff. Like I said, another conversation for another day. Yeah, exactly. Now, he's a guy that certainly uh, doesn't stoop to that level. In fact, he's mm. one of the biggest voices on the planet. You won't find him doing $10 rip and reads. <laughs> <laughs> no sorry, Bob. <laughs> this guy uh, was um, one of the biggest trailer voices uh, during the 90s in America, or internationally, um, one of the top five guys. He reckoned there were about 15 that were making really good coin out of movie trailers, and there were five that pretty well took the lion's share, and he was one of the five. Mm. So let's get to part two of the interview with Nick Tate. In a world, in a world where only the best voice will do. Realtimecasting.com I neglected to tell you that Vince had done quite a lot of work with Donna Fontaine. So what Vince did with me after I'd worked with him for a while, we became great pals. He said, Nick, I want you to get a good agent because it would be great for you and it would help me to, to promote you. 
Uh, so what I want to do is he said, I've got about three promos here that Don did. He said, I think you could do them. He said, I, I want you to revoice them. I'll direct you. We'll put it in the movies. And they know who did those movies. They know that's Don. So if I play it to them and it's you, they're going to say, oh, wait a minute. Who's that? And that's exactly what happened. Uh, I didn't do them like Don. I did them the way that I do them, you know. And that's why they went, wait a minute, let's see this guy. And I was dead lucky. But not everybody's going to walk into a party and meet a Vince Sklenner who's going to say, you're going to make a million dollars with that voice. It's one of those stories, man, you know, and it happened to me. Yeah. So I got lucky, real lucky. Yeah, everyone gets lucky, but there's an old saying, the harder you work, the luckier you get. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. So. But I used to feel bad for pals of mine who I had known all through the early period when we were all struggling to get the voiceover work. And I knew they had voices every bit as good as mine, and they could not get into the voiceover world apart from smaller jobs. And I even introduced them to my agent, and he'd say to me, Nick, will you stop bringing me these guys? I said, but he's got a great voice. He said, sure, he's got a great voice, but that's it. It's just great. It's not, he doesn't tell the stories that you tell. He doesn't yeah. have the dominance that Don has. You know, I want something that's exceptional. That's what I do as an agent. I have to have exceptional voiceover guys. Sounds like I'm blowing my own trumpet. I don't think I'm exceptional at all. But I did corner up a specific market back in those days. Yeah. And um, that's what you have to do. You've got to find an area where you can fit. I've, I have worked for Triple M now on and off uh, for about eight years. Yeah. I always think, well, that's that's that. You know, I won't hear for, I don't hear for a week or two. And I think, well, that's it. It's all over. You know, they won't be back. And then suddenly there's a whole, whole wave of work comes on again. And yeah. I, I only work for one hour a week for them. That's all I've ever done. Sometimes it stretches into two hours because they have something special going on. But and And we cover... I mean, I, and you probably do the same thing, I literally cover dozens of different voiceovers for them yeah. during, uh, which would never be tolerated here in America. You're booked for a session, the session is for an hour, you're asked to do one voiceover. Even though you're based in the US, you're still a very, very well-known voice in Australia. The thing is, I love it. Yeah. I love Australia. I, I love the fact that I have been on Triple M for eight years. and I, It's like my child, in a way. And I love the guys that I work with. Brendan is, is, is a sweetheart. Uh, and and Sidey, in, Brendan's in, in Melbourne and Sidey's yeah. in, in Sydney. They're great guys. And they're yeah. very, very good at what they do. They're every bit as good as any voiceover producer I've ever worked for in America. But as you know, Brendan and a lot of the guys who create the promos don't actually work from the radio station anymore. Yes, yes, indeed. Well, I think technology has brought that about for all of us. Thank yeah. God. Yeah, you, what, what do you see? Do you, you see this technology thing as an absolute plus? Oh, yes, absolutely. The mm. only thing that I think is negative about it is that it's nice, more often than not, to press the flesh. I mean, Brendan is a very, very personable guy. Sidey's real fun to be with. So in both instances, you know, I miss their presence. I used to go into Sydney all the time into the studios with Sidey. Uh, Michael Anderson's his name, incidentally. Yeah. And he's called Sideshow because Michael Anderson r ran the company uh, and, and Sidey had exa exactly the same name. So he had to be known by everybody as Sidey, you know, Sideshow. Yeah, Sideshow Mike, yeah. And then Brendan came along when we started doing the stuff in Melbourne. The VO Radio Show is produced in the studios of Voodoo Sound. Radio. <laughs> TV. Sound Design. Find it all at voodoo-sound.com. My work is very narrow in terms of what I'm known for, uh, in terms of voiceovers, that is. Yeah. Uh, the movie trailers is it. My agent now, Tishman, retired, and I moved over to Vox. They wanted me because I'm a movie trailer guy, you know, and they didn't have any movie trailer guys that were being successful, at least. Strangely enough, the career that I had when I was here in the 90s I, mean, I was going into voiceover studios uh, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times a day. Uh, it was mind-boggling. I mean, Don LaFontaine often did 25 sessions a day. That's how popular and how busy and how dominant he was. Wow. I never reached that kind of number, nor did I want to. I mean, God bless his socks, Don died. Uh, I, f I felt that he just worked himself too hard, you know? Mm. And he said to me, when, when I first started working, I did Jurassic Park. He was coming down the corridor at Tishman. He reached out and stopped me and said, Nicky. I went, hi, Don. And he said, come here. And I came on and put his arms around me and he said, welcome. You're in the loop. And I said, um, 
in, in the loop? He said, sure. He said, ma'am, you know, your feet are never going to touch the ground now. One word of advice, never take a vacation. Never. He said, do you know how many guys out there would kill you, would stab you in the back to be where you are, to have what you have? At one particular point in time, it was, as the five men lim limo will indicate to you, we were the top five voiceover guys in America mm -hmm. doing movie trailers. I mean, there were other areas, comedy voices, cartoon voices, uh, radio voices, um, uh, commercial voices. Well, we weren't doing those things. We were doing movie trailers. And there was only probably 15, but there were five guys that were dominating. And then Don alone was getting more than three times the next closest guy to him. And at one point in time, my work was at such a level where I was probably number two or arguably number three in America doing movie trailers. And it was a very thrilling and exciting and hardworking time. I started living on coffee and I wasn't a huge coffee drinker in the beginning, but I started realizing that I was getting really shaky and, and excited, you know, and I realized that every time I did another voiceover, I'd go to Starbucks on the way because I had to drive myself from Burbank. Then I'd have to come out and go down to Century City area. And then from there, I'd have to go to Santa Monica, then back to Burbank and then over to Century City again to these various voiceover studios. Like I felt like a courier for my voice. I was driving <laughs> myself everywhere. And Don, he had a limo and he had a driver. And a lot of people would go, oh, who does he think he is driving around a limo? What's he doing, you know? Show off. No, he wasn't. He just was exhausted. And he would fall into the back of the limo and the guy wouldn't know where he had to go, drive across town, take him to the next one, you know? And Don didn't even care where he was going. He'd just go to sleep. Can you imagine doing 25 sessions a day? I don't know how you can physically do it, quite frankly. Well, I would, how he did it was this. I, I, I remember going to um, LA Sound one day and there was a, literally a queue of voiceover producers. I said, what's going on? And they said, oh, Don's in Studio C. And Don was in Studio C, and typically they would book an hour for a, for a thing. The producers booked him for three hours, from two o'clock until five o'clock, and he, he just kept them rolling through. People were coming from Paramount, they were coming from Universal, coming for 20th Century Fox to work with this guy, because typically they would want him to go to them, and he used to. But you just can't get to 25 studios, not in L.A. traffic. You yeah. Know? He said, you want me, I'm going to be at L.A. Sound. I'm, I'm booked for three hours, so I'll break it up into lots of four. Every hour I'll do 15 minutes, so that's 12. So 12 of you can come along. And he would get it done. He would give them, he'd give them four, actually. He'd give them the first read that he thought it should be. Then he would give them a fast version of that. Then he'd give them a slow version of that. And then he'd say, you get one take more. What do you want? Faster, slower, more different pronunciation, what do you want, you know? And he, it wasn't that he was a snob or that he was a bully. He just was so good at what he did. Yeah. I never did that because I didn't have that quality, you know? I guess I was a bit of a pushover. I would let them make me do eight or nine or ten takes. But you know what? They typically go back and take two or take three yeah. or even take one. Yep. But they felt that they had to teach me and show me what they wanted. And some people became paranoid when I walked in, people that didn't know me. The voice for the voices. This is the VO Radio Show. Well, you've got an Australian accent, I'd say. Yeah, I'm an Australian. No, no, but this is Nick Tate that did Jurassic Park. We want him. Is there two Nick Tates? What's going on? I said, no, no, I'm that guy. I just... Don't walk around talking like an American, all right? You know, you want me to do it when I'm working and you're paying me money, I'll be an American. Meantime, I'm me as an Aussie. They, some of them accepted it and, and understood because I could deliver for them. Uh, one woman in particular didn't. She got really angry and carried on and kept on thinking that I was bullshitting her, that I wasn't the guy that had done Jurassic Park. Uh, in fact, um, she fired me. She just didn't let me get into it. We tried it several times, and she would always stop me after the first line. I know that I had to say, Rupert Murdoch is the king of entertainment. And she said, no, no, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You keep on saying entertainment. It's not entertainment. It's entertainment, all right? Uh, all fine, let's do it again. So, Rupert Murdoch is the king of entertainment. Say, so, you know, you still say entertainment. It's not entertainment. It's entertainment. I said, so you want me to say Rupert Murdoch is the king of entertainment? Well, not exactly like that, but yeah, you're nearly there. <laughs> she drove me crazy. I said to her after about 10 goes with this woman, and she was, I can't, I can't we get to line two? You know, there's 25 lines in this read. Can't we do that, please? 
no, I, I, I want you to get this right at the beginning. Otherwise, the rest is not. I said, no, it doesn't work like that. Let me read it right through, and we go back and make some fixes. We never got to there with her. She was from Texas. You know, she's talking to me like that, you know. I don't think, no, entertainment, you know. You said entertainment. She was definitely... I've never seen her again. I don't believe she ever got another producer's job. And um, lucky for me, it didn't mean anything that she fired me. Because I said to her, I said, I think I'm the wrong guy for this job. And she said, you know what? I think you're right. You're fired. Yeah, I, that yeah. never happened to me again, at least not right there on the spot. They might not have used me again, but not like that. That was <laughs> uh, The very first job I did for Tisherman, um, he was trying to get me into movie trailers. Steve still wasn't convinced that movie trailers was my area because he thought that I whispered everything that I did. And um, he said, you know, Donna Fontaine's got this big, tanking, cut-through voice, Nick, and you, you did it on one of the promos, and so I know you can do it, and I just want you to do that. And I said, but I don't feel that when I'm doing things like 1492. You know, it's a gentle, mysterious conquest of paradise, that kind of thing. Yeah. And, um, yeah, sure, okay. But anyway, um, so... He sent me along for uh, a commercial read, and um, I got a call from Tishman one night when I was going home. In those days, I didn't even have a cell phone. Mm -hmm. uh, my pager went off, and I was driving home, and it was an emergency number from Tishman, and I stopped in Brentwood at a Starbucks, and there was a phone there, and I rang him, and I said, what's going on? He said, can you get yourself back to Margarita Mix? in the next 20 minutes and I said oh, if, if I go right now I'm well, why what's happening he said there's a guy there he's got laryngitis and uh, he has always done the ITT voices and this is a big break Nick if you get this um, so get back there quickly okay so I drove back to Margarita Mix I'd been there once or twice I knew where it was and I just got there in the 20 minutes and I come bursting through the door and there's the guy at the microphone reading and all the producers suddenly turn around and look at me and go oh yeah just wait outside would you please and I, go, I didn't think much about it you know the guy was at the microphone he was doing his stuff i waited i sat there for half an hour i didn't know what they were doing or why i was waiting except that i'd been told there was somebody that had laryngitis and they wanted to replace him finally this big guy comes out with silver hair who was the man that i'd seen standing at the microphone doing the voiceovers and he looks at me and he says good luck and walks off down the corridor. And then the girl comes out and she says, Nick, could you come in, please? And so I go in with these people. And they, they said, oh, that was embarrassing. I said, well, I'm sorry, what was embarrassing? They said, well, you see, he insisted that he do all the four promos that we have for ITT. He's been our voice for five years. He's very well known all over the country. And uh, he, he just didn't sound the same. And we got really worried. So we listened to Tishman's Reel and we, you know, there was about 50 voices on there. And we heard your voice and we think that you sound like him, except you don't have laryngitis and he does. So <laughs> would you just very quickly just do these for us, please? Uh, he's already done them, uh, so we'll play them to you, and then you can read the script along, and then when you're ready, you can do it. So that's what I did. I, I, I listened to him, and he sounded great to me. Even with laryngitis, he sounded great, you know? Yeah. He clearly was, and I'd seen him as a, a film actor as well. And he's now, uh, for many years, became the voice of BMW after ITT, because I got the voice of ITT. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, what was they took his material back to New York and they played it to the, the kingpin there who said, oh, God, he sounds like he's got laryngitis, but, you know, it's not bad. I think we can live with it. And they said, well, now, wait a minute. We tried another guy. And they said, you did? Yeah, yeah just listen to this guy. Played me and he said, okay, book him. And um, they then flew back to L.A. a week later and we did all those four over again. And um, I became the voice of ATT for two years. Wow. Until my, voice, my my promo work as then, you know, the Jurassic Park and so on got so big that um, I went in another direction. I was doing movie trailers and, and not doing commercial. I thought you were going to say you got laryngitis and someone came along and stole your gig. No, but I, I, you know, about four years into my career, when I was right at the peak of doing the voiceovers, uh, I did get laryngitis. I got a, I got a. Um, Thing like Hong Kong flu, it was really, really bad. I remember being in bed and shaking over the weekend, and that's when the peak hit me and was sweating like crazy. And I was totally alone because my wife had gone away to see her father in England and um, taking the kids with her. 
But I came back to the studios again on Monday and Tuesday, and I was actually losing work because the producers all said, you sound like shit, Nick, go away, you know. And and they just won't keep you on the on the movie trailer when they do that because they get somebody else. They know you're not going to get better for three or four days if you're mm. lucky. Damn, I was sick. And the funny part about it was I have another friend of mine who is a good voiceover guy. And he said to me, have you insured your voice? This is about a month before that. And I said, what would I insure my voice for? A million dollars? You're kidding. He said, no, I'm not. He said, Nick, this is your tool now, right? This is where you earn your living. What are you going to do if you lose your voice? I said, I'm not going to lose my voice. You, you might. You might get laryngitis, you know. So I didn't do it. And I got really ill and I lost work. Some months after that, I did, in fact, insure my voice for a million dollars. And fortunately, um, I never got sick again and <laughs> didn't collect the money. In a world. In a world where only the best voice will do. Realtimecasting.com. As I told you, I, I would do about eight sessions a day times five is, well, that'd be a really good week, 40 voiceovers. But there are not five men in the limo anymore. There's about 55 who are clones of all the sounds. But, you know, I shot myself in the foot when I went back to Australia in 2001, walked away from the industry. Now, if you recall, the Olympic Games was happening in Australia, what was it, 2000? Uh, yeah, 2000, yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I had come back then, um, and I had a, an apartment in Sydney, which I wanted to turn into a voiceover studio apartment. It was in Neutral Bay, and I had to get technicians to come in and wire it for me. But all the ISD technicians in Australia in 2000 were at Homebush, and I couldn't get anybody to help me, and my voiceover career went into the toilet because I was on several very big films, and in the daytime in Sydney, I could work at Dave and Dave's or Stellar Sound or some of those great studios that, that existed in those days. And they all had ISDN or whatever was required to connect with America. And so I wanted to get it in my home because the typical panic time in America is 10 o'clock in the morning when they want what the work they were doing the day before, they want it changed by between 9 and 10 in the morning. And as you know, 17 hours different. Right. So 10 o'clock in the, in the morning in L.A. is 3 o'clock in the morning in Sydney. And I couldn't get Stella Sound or Dave and Dave's or any other studio to work with me at 3 o'clock in the morning. No. <laughs> Especially when it was, I couldn't tell them until 20 minutes before, I need you now. But it was an impossibility because when they ask you in the States to fix something or to change something, they want it done now. And yeah. when I say now, I mean in the next 20 minutes. Hmm. So you have to always, I was, I was like a B2 bomber circling over LA, you know, I was around all the voiceover studios. So if somebody wanted me to change something or do something new, I could just arrive there within 20 minutes because any longer than that, somebody else has arrived there or you have put the five producers that are sitting in the chair waiting for you to arrive noses out of joint because you're not there on time. The voice for the voices. This is the VO radio show. Tell you a funny story. When I finally got the ISDN set up in my apartment, uh, the toilet was on the other side of our bedroom, and between the two of them, there was a changing room. Uh, so I set my sound booth, because I didn't have room for it in the apartment as a booth. So I set it into the, the walls of the changing booth, and the clothes hanging there acted like baffles. Mm -hmm. and I was doing some big international films in my clothing closet in Sydney. I, I used to laugh to myself about if they only knew what was going on. So I got this booking, came in, and, and typically it was 10 o'clock in the morning, and they wanted to work with me at 3 a.m., and I said, sure, just just call me a few minutes before, and I'll wake up. But I needed half an hour to wake up because I go and put the coffee on and get myself up. On this particular day, I'd done that. I'd got the coffee, and I was ready to go, and my wife was asleep in the bedroom. And I started doing the voiceovers with the guys, and they said, oh, Nick, okay, where well, you ready there? Now, where are you? I said, I'm in Sydney, man. I'm in Sydney. Yeah. So what? There was that beach there, Bond, Bondi Beach. You going to Bondi Beach, are you now? And I said, um, no, no, <laughs> that's 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm, I'm not going to Bondi Beach, mate. Anyway, we call it Bondi. Oh, okay, fine, you know. So we're, we're doing the voiceover, and my wife gets up, and she comes in, and she goes, what are you doing? You're making such a lot of noise. I said, Hazel, I'm in the middle of work, right, sweetie? So she walks through to the bathroom. I said, oh, Hazel, don't flush. The guy said, what was that, Nick? I said, nothing, nothing. I'm just talking to my wife. She's just passing by, you know, 3 o'clock in the morning. Don't worry about it. Everything's fine. I told her we're working. So she'd gone back to bed. 
So they, okay, so we go on and Hazel finally comes out and fortunately she doesn't flush. She goes back to bed and I'm continuing on with the work with the guys and about 20 minutes later they finish. They say, wow, that worked well, Nick, thanks a lot. You can go back to bed now, right? Or are you going to Bondi Beach? I said, no, no, I'm going back to bed. I said, good, tell your wife she can flush now. Uh, perfect. And that is a perfect way yeah. to uh, to wind up because I know you've got things to do. And thank you very much, Nick Tate, for joining us on the VO Radio Show uh, broadcast around the world. Thanks, Andrew. <laughs> the VO Radio Show is produced in the studios of Voodoo Sound. Radio. TV. Sound design. Find it all at voodoo-sounds.com. So if you're interested, and you should be after listening to that, and you haven't heard it as yet, the part one of that interview is actually our episode two. So make sure you go back and have a listen to um, to how it all started for Nick, because um, it's a very interesting story in itself, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Fascinating mm-hmm. guy. So yeah, episode two, if you want to go back and have a listen to uh, how it all began for Mr. Tate. Yep. So just a bit of a self-indulgent plug uh, for those who are interested. My new website's up. If you want to go and have a look at that, you can find it at voodoo-sound.com is the new address for that for you to go and have a look at. So um, if you need some radio imaging or some post-production work, um, please go and have a look. I'd be interested to have a chat. Absolutely. And if you want to use Larissa Gallagher, who's our voice of the VO radio show, you can find her at realtimecasting.com. Yeah, do yourself a favour. She's brilliant. Yeah. Have a great week. See you then. Cheers. The VO Radio Show is produced in the studios of Voodoo Sound. To polish your next audio production, check us out at voodoo-sound.com. Find professional voices simply all in one place. Realtimecasting.com, including me.